Hey everybody, Josh at Silka here, coming to you with the next episode of Marginal Gains TV. Today's episode is a pretty exciting one, I think. It's uh, called Coefficients and Dimensionless Numbers, Part 1. This one is so big, we need two parts. So, coefficients, dimensionless numbers. You will hear on this show, uh, and pretty much any time you talk to any really geeky, really technical engineering type, you are going to hear some coefficient of this, coefficient of that uh, sort of things thrown around. You may even hear uh, some dimensionless numbers like the Reynolds number uh, thrown around. Um, what are they? Why do we use them? Well, uh, let's dig in here because I think you're going to see that they may seem a little counterintuitive or a little hard to work with up front, but man, do they make our lives easier uh, when we have the discussions that we like to have on this show uh, and with each other when we're trying to go fast. So let's start with coefficient, right? In its simplest form, everybody who took algebra knows that a coefficient looks something like this. That 4 in front of the 4x, that's the coefficient, okay? It's it, it baseline. It's that simple. Uh, it, the coefficient is what we call a scalar number, right? And a scalar number is a uh, essentially a value that has no direction, right? So it's not a vector. It's a scalar. Uh, ideally, with a coefficient, a scalar number like this, it's something that uh, you can multiply with, you can divide with, you can use in the math and it will give you a, uh, a good, reasonable outcome, right? If, uh, if I say 4x, and then I plug things in for x, uh, you know, if x is 2, then y is 8, uh, and, you know, if x is 3, then y is 12, right? It, it, it's very, it, the math works. It's predictive. Um, that's not always true when we're talking with, uh, you know, vectors, right? Things can get quite complicated there because you have directionalities. That's why aerodynamics get really, really complicated. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit in part two when we talk Reynolds numbers, uh, and then we talk about the uh, Navier-Stokes equations, which are sort of our best representation of how to mathematically do aerodynamics, and things get really dirty. Uh, but for now, coefficients, right? So let's start with uh, Probably the most common coefficient that we uh, talk about, uh, and that is the coefficient of friction. So coefficient of friction, uh, shown here, is used by engineers typically as a mu. It looks like kind of a funky little lowercase u, a uh, little cursive guy. It's actually Greek, uh, the Greek letter mu. So what is the coefficient of friction? Well. I happen to have right here this awesome container of Silka Gear Wipes. Shameless product plug will change your life, make cleaning easier. Um, but for this purpose, we just want them for their mass. Now, this canister of Gear Wipes, we're going to say, weighs uh, or has the mass of one kilogram. And so I sit it on my table, one kilogram, and I am going to take my finger here, my calibrated measuring device, and I am going to push this along the table. And I am going to say that that is 500 grams of force to push it along the table. So mu is defined as the force to slide or to translate uh, this canister divided by the force, uh, the normal force, which is uh, essentially the force that this is putting down into the table. Now, engineers and physicists and mathematicians at home, you are really, really cranky with me right now because I am talking about forces and masses and I am using kilograms of normal force and kilograms of translational force um, instead of Newtons. And I'm gonna be honest, nobody really wraps their head around Newtons that well unless you're doing it every day. Uh, I even find if I'm out of it for a couple of weeks traveling, doing business stuff, I sit back down, I try to think in Newtons. It's, it's, just, not, uh, it's just not intuitive. It's a little bit like, you know, you grow up in the imperial system and you try to think in metric or vice versa. That's a little bit what Newtons feel like to me. Uh, it's a linear translation between them, but it just confuses things that tiny, tiny bit. So why is this a big deal? Well, we, to get the force, we need a mass times of gravity. So our normal force, our, pulling back out here, our one kilogram of uh, normal force is actually one kilogram of mass times 
uh, gravity, which here at sea level is like 9.807. Uh, gravity is an acceleration, uh, which makes the units ugly and complicated. Uh, so, you know, if we were to write it out, it looks something like this. I say one, uh, one kilogram times 9.807. I get a bunch of units, but here's where the dimensionless thing comes in handy. I'm going to put that over my translational force here, and I'm going to end up, because it's a force, I'm going to end up with all the same units. And so when I go through and cross the units out, what you see is I end up with a dimensionless number. Right? This is beautiful because as much as the engineers and the scientists hate when I use kilograms and grams of force, they really hate doing equations that have 800 units in there that you have to go through and make sure everything works out. So we tackle that in the sciences by coming up with these dimensionless quantities where essentially you put a thing over a thing and the units all cancel out. So we end up with a scalar number that has no units. In this instance here, right, the 500 to push, the 1,000 normal force, our coefficient of friction, our mu, would be 0.5. That makes sense? So we get the, the translational force divided by the normal force. All the units are gone. It's 0.5. So we say the coefficient of friction of, bring it back out, this canister on this sliding on this table is 0.5. Now, What's really exciting is that if we wanted to do a whole bunch of math uh, around this problem, we can now take that 0.5 and we can work it in almost any scenario, right? If this guy's sliding at uh, you know, 0.1 meters per second, if he's sliding at 1 meter per second, if he's sliding at 10 meters a second, I can just use that 0.5 uh, in there. So we have just saved ourselves a tremendous amount of time in all future uh, predictions, pr future mathematics based around this thing sliding on this table. Okay, so I hope you're starting to see uh, the, the power of this, that, you know, instead of saying, it, you know, it takes X amount of force to push this thing at this speed, and then having to do that test every time at different speeds, we realize that uh, the scalar quantity, it's it can be used throughout. It's the same everywhere. Now, let's take this into rolling resistance uh, of a bicycle tire, because this is super complicated. You've got coefficient of friction issues. You've got interlocking of the tire rubber and the road surface. Uh, I mean, this is a really, really complicated problem, okay? You've got hysteresis losses in the casing. Um, there's a bunch of stuff going on, a bunch of stuff to measure, and let's be honest, you go into the lab, you measure all this stuff, it takes hours and hours. If you were to come back and say, it's X amount of force to roll this tire on this surface at this speed, you're now stuck in a place when uh, somebody comes back and says, well, I don't ride that speed. I go faster or slower. You now kind of have to do it all over again. Except that we have created this dimensionless quantity called the coefficient of rolling resistance, uh, the CRR. And the CRR is essentially uh, similar to what we just did with our gear wipes sliding on the table, except it's, it is a value that we've worked through in the mathematics to be a dimensionless quantity um, that really defines the, the speed-dependent, mass-dependent, or normal force-dependent losses of that tire, right? So... It's a little more work up front when you're doing the rolling resistance uh, testing, right? So it's pretty easy in that when you're doing the testing, you are going to get the force, uh, the, the, uh, the losses uh, coming out. That's what you're measuring, right? You're typically going to be measuring a, uh, it electronically. It's going to be a, you know, an amperage change or uh, a heat rise or some of the, one of these other things. Maybe you're measuring it in, in force. Um, there's a ton of ways to do it. But... The engineers doing that testing are going to take those values and they are going to mathematically work that back down into this thing that we call CRR. And why do we do that? Well, here is the part of the Martin equation uh, that, that covers the rolling losses or the, the force uh, required to roll the wheel, right? So we're going to call it F roll. And you see in here, I've got, you know, I've got gravity. Uh, I've got this whole cosine arctangent, uh, you know, uh, slope 
thing, right? This, this g over 100, that's a gradient. That is another beautiful dimensionless number uh, that we're going to use because if we didn't use it as gradient, uh, we would end up with even more trigonometry than, than we've got. Um, so I'm going to use uh, gradient here. Uh, then I'm going to go in, I've got more mass, and I've got a CRR. Now if that CRR wasn't right there, that would be replaced by a bunch of translational forces times mu's times other, uh, other measured values and other scalars um, that would define the rolling force for that, uh, for that system. But we can compress all of that and all of its units into this one value called CRR, right? And when I do that, the equation becomes highly simplified compared to what it was. Um, the beauty of this is when I now work this uh, into my power at the legs equation, which we'll put up right uh, here, okay? This is like the full Martin equation. You've got your drivetrain loss, you've got your, uh, your rolling resistance losses, you've got your aerodynamics losses, right? Um, in there, everything is times V, times a V squared in the case of, uh, of arrow, and then a, a V at the end there. You see that we have essentially linearized uh, these things by using these coefficients. I mean, when I look at the full equation here, uh, you think of something as complicated as rolling resistance is now just a linear term, right? It's a scalar term in this equation. Uh, that I can say this tire is better than that one or worse than that one. Uh, it changes here uh, in the equation. We work the math through and we get these beautiful power predictions uh, at the end. Even more exciting, look at the CD term here, right? This, the CD term is uh, now become a, a scalar, right? A linear term within our equation. Now, this takes out uh, or really simplifies from a lot of the, the complexities of the drag force measurement work that would be done in the wind tunnel, right? So if I go to the wind tunnel and I come back with a lot of drag force value, it's all speed dependent. It's all air density dependent, right? It's, there's all these dependencies in that that I would have to take into account every single time I ran this equation. By converting that into this dimensionless coefficient uh, I've actually got a number that I can just plug in uh, and use really simply in this equation uh, at any speed, at any mass, right? Because I'm handling the speed, the velocity, and the mass in this equation, and I'm at, because I've taken it out uh, of the initial test condition. The second, really, maybe the third, fourth beauty, I don't know. This is a pretty beautiful thing, if you ask me. This requires you to do way less math when you solve these problems. Um, but the other thing that it helps us do is sort of linearize things that might, uh, that actually aren't otherwise linear, right? So you see here, I've got CD uh, and I've got CRR, um, you know, essentially as scalars in this equation. Um, what I can do is I can now make comparisons uh, between CDA, we'll throw the A in there for now, we'll talk about this in part two, why it's CDA and not CD. Um, but I will, I can use CDA and CRR and I can compare the relative values of them uh, much more simply. So this is a, a awesome thing that our good friend Robert Chung uh, threw together. If you have not listened to the Robert Chung interview uh, at the Marginal Gains podcast, you absolutely have to. It's a phenomenal episode. He is such a brilliant and wonderful person. Um, but Robert put this together for us, and this is just so uh, illustrative of the power of these coefficients. So this here is a chart that he threw together comparing a Continental GP4000 uh, to a Continental GP5000, both with latex tubes, and then comparing them to, uh, to mass at various slopes. Now, we can do this because of the power of using these coefficients, right? We can talk about everything really in the same, uh, in the same graph, kind of in the same scale, because we've linearized it all uh, in a way to, to something that can be plotted on the, same, on the same chart. And look at this graph. This is really a thing of beauty. So between the two tires, you have a 0 
count them, 0, 0, 0, 007 um, difference in the coefficient of rolling resistance. Now, coefficient of rolling resistance uh, it, it becomes interchangeable here with slope because of the way the math is done in the background. So the other way to think of that would be you've got 0 0.0007, right? This position would be your percent of gray, or uh, when you're talking gradients, percent. So this would be like a 1% grade. So you have a 0.07% grade difference. So riding the higher resistance tire is like riding up a 0.07% slope all the time compared to the rider on the faster tire. Now, how does that translate into mass and slope? And this is where this, this dotted line here uh, becomes so powerful. This dotted line is 500 grams of mass change. And let's look at that. The two lines intersect way out here at 10%. So the 0 0.0007 CRR change, that sounds like nothing. Fourth four places from the decimal, right? That sounds like nothing. But look at the importance here. That, on a 10% grade, is the equivalent of 500 grams of mass, right? So we all, we talk about, we obsess over the weight of things. And look, less than 10% grade, the rolling resistance is significantly more important here than the mass. You have to get all the way out to the 10% grade just for them to become equal. Um, that's the power of using coefficients for this. If we were trying to do this with forces and masses and gravities and all this other stuff, this actually becomes uh, really kind of impossible to get our heads around. But we put everything into this coefficient form, and now we've got a language, sort of a common currency that we can talk to each other about. And that excites me, because in my daily life, these are the kind of things that we talk about all the time, uh, you know, a CRR change of 0 0.0007, uh, you know, from this product to that product or this tube to that tube, um, it, it, as we all gain experience with it, you are going to begin to talk uh, in this common currency as well and really, I think, get a hold of it in your brain in a way that it becomes more intuitive than just saying, it's so many grams of force, uh, you know, times the mass. Well, I don't ride at that speed. I'm heavier than you. I ride slower than you. These are things that we can all discuss in ways that are really relevant to all of us in all of these conditions. Uh, so there you have it. That is coefficients, dimensionless numbers, part one. Uh, part two, we're going to come back and we are going to talk about the Reynolds number, uh, which you want to talk about a unit nightmare. Uh, this is the kind of unit nightmare that makes uh, engineering students want to punch themselves in the face. Um, but thank God for Mr. Reynolds. He uh, de-dimensionalized this for us into, uh, yeah, a pretty simple quantity. And then we'll talk about CD and CDA and then how those two uh, interact with each other because it's pretty fascinating. Anyway. Thanks again for listening to Marginal Gains TV. Make sure you come back uh, for number two. And then also, please make sure that you like us right down here. Uh, and please, please, please share us with your super geeky cycling friends to help them find, uh, well, help them be able to talk to you about this awesome stuff that you're learning in the show here. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you soon.